So we heard from Naomi Oreskes the story of how a few Cold War scientists were so successfully able to manufacture doubt about climate change, especially early on in the fight. But climate change denial is as active as ever, and now involves some of the richest and most powerful individuals and corporations on Earth, individuals and corporations who fund the work of skeptics and help spread their message. Perhaps most important of these funders are David and Charles Koch, or the Koch brothers, spelled K-O-C-H. Tied to the fossil fuel industry through their company, Koch Industries, together the brothers are worth more than $80 billion and have become a key source of funding for scientists, networks, and think tanks spreading doubt about climate change. They also have enormous influence over the Republican Party. In fact, in parallel to the very public race occurring among Republican presidential hopefuls, there's also a very private race to court the Koch brothers' support. In what has become widely known as the Koch primary, leading candidates such as Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and Scott Walker were practically summoned to speak to the Koch brothers and a small group of Koch allied donors at a private summit they held in California. The reason the brothers have such pull is that they have announced plans to spend upwards of $900 million on the next election cycle. So perhaps no wonder, given their stance on climate change, that the list of prominent Republicans who believe the science on the issue has dwindled to almost none. Kurt Davies has been investigating the Koch brothers and the hidden relationships between the funders and scientists who form the backbone of the climate denial networks for years. He currently runs the Climate Investigation Center and previously held positions at Greenpeace, where he spearheaded research into the Koch brothers' funding of climate denial, as well as Exxon and other fossil fuel interests. Kurt Davies has been quoted or featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, the BBC, and CNN, among other outlets. I reached Kurt Davies by Skype. Well, Kurt Davies, welcome to The Elephant. Thank you. So in this episode, we're taking a look at the merchants of doubt, what Naomi Oreskes calls the merchants of doubt, the people who and institutions who have purposefully spread doubt and tried to block any meaningful action from being done on climate change. And I'd say there's, there's two main parts in this. It's the, the people who fund it and the individual spokespeople or scientists who help spread the message. And I want to focus on the funder side primarily and specifically on the one example of the Koch brothers. Now, I I think they've become better known in in recent years, but especially outside of America, I'd say the Koch brothers are still largely unknown to most people. Who are the Koch brothers and and why do they matter? Well, they're they're extremely rich uh, American businessmen whose father made a a lot of money on a technology to crack oil, essentially distilling oil into components we, we can use. He actually stole that technology from another company and then went out and made his own company uh, and started doing this building out this company in the in the US bequeathed it to his two sons who are now the richest men in America and together among the richest people in the world their estimated worth is something around 40 billion each so they're very influential and they're super ideological their their ideology is a pure uh, free market anti-government ideology. In fact, you know, in their earliest years, David Koch ran against uh, Ronald Reagan on the libertarian ticket in 1980. And his platform at that point was to abolish half the government, like to shut down half of the agencies of the government. Uh, Their current, one of their current favorite candidates, um, Scott Walker of Wisconsin, is actually proposing to shut down the Environmental Protection Agency. That that was that'd be one of the first things he does if he gets elected as the Republican candidate for president. So they've maintained this um, very anti-government rhetoric. They've built a network of front groups that do the work for them and with them, and they're uh, they're trying to change this country. So you you mentioned they're they're involved with oil and gas. Can you give us a scale of? the types of different holdings they have and types of different involvements they have within this industry? It's actually very hard to do because they are a private company, so they don't have shareholders, and therefore they don't have much public disclosure of their various interests and their various holdings. They have uh, have had historically a heavy interest in oil pipelines, for example. They own some oil refineries that are big oil refineries. They do a, a heavy business in the heavy oil from Canada that is the tar sands oil and other oil from Canada that takes a specific type 
type of refinery. It's a you know a harder process than some of the other types of crude. So they have that technology. They do a lot of commodities trading. So they trade in futures and they they trade in just about everything. Uh, they also own Invista, which is a huge chemical company that makes fabrics like Lycra and Spandex. In fact, there are several factories in Germany that are Invista factories. So they have assets all over the world that they've acquired. And they're diversifying, and they are not just an oil uh, company or an oil mercantile company. So that's the kind of business they are. They're, they're very private, very um, secretive. In fact, years ago, they used to call themselves the biggest company nobody's ever heard of. Uh, so it's, it's come out in the past five years, they have gone from invisible to very visible. I'll give you an example. When we, went, when we had that initial report, before we published it, we went to New York and went to multiple prominent news organizations and said we had done this background dig on the Koch brothers, on David Koch, and multiple very important reporters said, who? And it's the richest man in New York at that point. Uh, they didn't know who he was. They didn't know what his agenda was. And he, there he was sitting in Manhattan funding the ballet, uh, you know, fairly prominent at the tuxedo party circuit. And they didn't know who he was. So it took a lot to unveil them. And now, now they're trying to do a PR campaign to soften their own image. And they've hired uh, a lot of very top-level PR professionals. And they've gone on a... Uh, killing them with kindness circuit at where they're inviting media to their meetings, they're doing interviews suddenly, they're, um, they're playing it in a very different way than they were five years ago. So they're, they're both collectively super rich. They're connected to the fossil fuel industry, even though that's, that's not their entire base for their operations. And they're also, as you mentioned, strident libertarians. Do we have a sense of, of what motivates them primarily in, in opposing climate change regulation? Is it ideology? Is it personal interests, financial interests? Do we have a sense of that? It's the it's the ideal question. I mean, no, we don't know which one it is, or and I think the answer is both. I think they do have, they definitely have financial interest in keeping the oil industry from being regulated and keeping fossil fuels from being regulated in any way. They also have a deep ideological mission, which is against government regulation and against government subsidy of other forms of energy. So they're running very big operations to kill renewable energy, even though they don't have a stake in it, and it really doesn't threaten their business model at all, simply because they think renewable energy is what they call a rent-seeking industry that is only viable with government subsidies, which is in part true. That, uh, you know, solar, you know, the story from in Germany, without good government policies enabling renewables to compete, it doesn't get off the ground because the other forms of energy are have been subsidized for the past 100 or 50 years and have uh, accumulated subsidies. And while they acknowledge that, they still are fundamentally against all government intervention in the marketplace. They have a, a religious belief almost that the marketplace should be unfettered by regulation and that somehow the market itself will solve all problems. It's really a, uh, an ideological uh, belief. In fact, Charles Koch's written books about this. So that's the harder thing to compete with. It's not a simple story of you know an ExxonMobil that really doesn't want people to believe climate change because they sell oil and they know that if we catch on, we'll stop using as much oil. It's a deeper philosophical and ideological uh, opponent we're dealing with here. Now, I want to talk about the actual mechanism of, about how uh, they go about spreading skepticism. So say you and I are, are David and Charles Koch, and, and you know, we, we really don't want any action taken on climate change. What then do we do? How, how does the, the actual process work from there? Well, that's a good question. I mean, they, I think what the way I look at it is they have built an infrastructure of these organizations, the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, uh, Heartland Institute, multiple organizations that have nice sounding names and seem innocuous or seem like just your average think tank infrastructure. They use these organizations to produce the intellectual backbone of their argument. So they'll produce a report about an issue. Then they use other organizations to vend that same report into the political arena. So they operate, they have a think tank 
that's the ideology and the sort of intellectual property. Then they have a political organization that goes to a politician and says, you really need to do something about this. Here's the report that says, and then they operate with this thing called the American Legislative Exchange Council, for example, who works directly with state legislators to change laws, to write new laws. And all these things together, uh, along with their political operations, their lobbying arms, form sort of a network of political action, intellectual thought, and field team that is able to change the dialogue. I'll give you one example. In the 2008 elections, in the run-up to when Obama was elected, and then in the 2010 elections, they ran a field campaign at the state level to make incoming politicians into the, the, the House and Senate pledge to do nothing on climate change, take a pledge that they would not take action on climate change. And they had uh, dozens of incoming freshman senators and, and representatives who had pledged that climate change was an issue that you know they would block, essentially block. And that became, you had to sign that pledge in order to be endorsed by the Koch apparatus, and therefore you signed the pledge and you got elected. You came to Washington and you were never going to have your mind changed about climate change. So that's one way, and that was a direct political effort. The other really insidious way that they operate is through these you know, sort of quasi-intellectual think tanks and they, they'll put out extensive reports to undermine um, policy. So one example I'm working on right now is something called the National Black Chamber of Commerce, which sounds like it represents the interests of African-American corporations when in fact the members are Chevron, Exxon, Coke, and that organization, National Black Chamber of Commerce, has since the 90s put out reports, essentially the same report over and over again, saying any climate policy will limit uh, the availability and uh, uh, increase the price of energy and inordinately hurt poor people, minorities, people with lower income. Good afternoon, Chair Cap Capitol, Ranking Member Carper, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Harry Alford. I'm President and CEO of the National Black Chamber of Commerce. I'm here today to testify about the Environmental Protection Agency's proposal to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants and the potential impacts of those proposed regulations on energy costs. In particular, I would like to focus on the potential adverse economic and employment impacts of the Clean Power Plan on low-income groups and minorities. According to a recent study commissioned by the National Black Chamber of Commerce, the Clean Power Plan would increase black poverty by 23% and Hispanic poverty by 26%. And that message, as you can imagine, is a, a real winner because nobody wants to hurt minorities. So, but it's a corporate message. It doesn't have anything to do with actual black business interests or actual interests of African American communities, for example. In fact, those communities are hurt more by climate change, by air pollution, by every environmental insult uh, down the road. So the Cokes, apparently, we just discovered, the Cokes are also funding the National Black Chamber of Commerce. Exxon has given them nearly a million dollars. They've put out all these reports dating back to the, to the mid-90s. They've been doing reports that, are, that serve then as testimony on the Hill, that are placed in newspapers as op-eds or as articles. And they seed this notion out that the climate policy now the clean power plan, the Obama, the best thing Obama's done and the thing that Obama's team is taking to Paris, the clean power plan, the National Black Chamber of Commerce is trying to attack that as harmful to people of color and, and minorities. In fact, Obama took that on directly in his speech announcing the clean power plan and, and countered them not by name. So uh, now we're working to show uh, what they've been doing for so long. And th those are just a couple examples of Basically, the you know we've tracked nearly eighty million dollars from the Cokes, thirty million from Exxon, and that's the tip of the iceberg on how much money has been invested in these organizations, whose at least part of their work is to stop climate solutions. When reading up on it, the think tanks are such a great way of going about it because obviously, if Exxon or or the Koch brothers came out with a a study uh, themselves that said you know climate change not really that much of a problem. You know, no, no one in the press would give it much credence, but if it comes through something that seems like it has some intellectual capital to it, suddenly it has that weight or it might be covered. 
Exactly. And we know that this has been deliberate. There's you know, one very uh, strong document that everybody's talked about, but not, a lot of people have not heard about. It's a 1998 American Petroleum Institute. It's called the Global Climate Science Communications Plan. And it was, re- it was leaked uh, and eventually front page of the New York Times, revealing a multi-million dollar, multi-year campaign to vend uncertainty. And they talk about victory will be achieved when reporters, when teachers, when policymakers talk about uncertainty on climate science. Uh, They talk about funding channels to be sent from trade associations through these think tanks and that they, those think tanks would then prop up scientists to say something different than the scientific consensus that was taking hold in 1998. And they really felt like they were losing after Kyoto, after, you know, suddenly there was a, a compulsory treaty being born. So, you know, we know, we have evidence that they have been, it's been a conscious act to use these think tanks as vehicles in what we call the climate denial machine. And I think it's important here, especially for your viewers or, or listeners to understand that you know climate denial is much more nuanced than just denying the fact that there is climate change in fact you know in fact there are very few people or organizations who are flat out denying the existence of a human fingerprint on the climate at this point it's changed into well it's not so bad or why would we upset the economy to solve something that we're still speculating about, you know, stressing uncertainty. But we define climate denial as, and I said this to The Guardian recently, and somehow it came out right, uh, anyone who is obstructing or delaying or derailing policy steps in line with the, the scientific consensus. So that if you believe the scientific consensus, the IPCC, that says we need to take rapid steps to decarbonize the economy, anything that obstructs that is denying the science, denying the the conclusions of the scientific community. Uh, So it doesn't mean just denying the facts. Recently, Charles Koch has been interviewed and he says, well, I don't, you know, I think there may be something, but it's not as serious. You know, sort of hedging, which is a very interesting trend, you know, going from being silent on the issue to more of a stance of techno fix, you know, it, it may be a problem, but we'll fix it with technology. And now sort of acknowledging it a little bit more while they have trained their political machine to be much more of a flat out denial message and they're you know teaching people across the country that the EPA is this fascist uh, you know organization trying to kill their jobs and that climate change is a mythology perpetrated by Al Gore uh, they're I think they know they're smart people they both went to MIT they're scientists by training uh, they know full well that something's going on, and I think uh, that's where the deepest kernel of uh, conflict is. So we've been talking about the Koch brothers. Uh, you also mentioned Exxon. Are they a big player in this, or, or maybe more broadly, who, who are the other major players in, in the financial side of this skepticism game? Yeah, I mean, this is part of the trick is figuring out who's funding all of these voice boxes. You know, we've talked about how the the think tanks are a very convenient way for the corporations to get their message out without having their fingerprints attached to it. What we did, we had a project uh, that I started 10 years ago called Exxon Secrets, started at Greenpeace, exxonsecrets.org was intended to show these financial linkages between Exxon's money and these climate denial uh, voices and you know institutions and individuals who are on TV all over the world saying something, uh, saying that climate change is not a problem and and shouldn't be dealt with. When we started connecting the dots and having reporters say, you know, from the Exxon funded think tank, uh, Exxon shied away. You know, the 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 parenthetical um, Exxon funded attached to the think tank didn't work for them as well. So Exxon stopped spending money in public on a lot of these groups around 2006, 2007, 2008, after being fairly well shamed about it and being unveiled. Other than that, we have very little intelligence on the big corporate funders. There are multiple chains of money that's invisible or dark money that roll through laundering operations here in the U.S., other NGOs that are set up to bring money in and then send money out. Um, so there's, I think we don't know the half of it, but we know an awful lot about where they're getting their money. I think ultimately summing it up, 
the the objective of these organizations is delay and they can get delay uh, delay policy solutions and delay being regulated by uh, slowing down the machine and they slow down the machine by by causing doubt on the science by causing doubt around the policies by throwing you know sticks in the spokes of the the wheels of the policy arena and they've done that very effectively for 25 years and I, I I don't think it can be underestimated how much they've slowed us down from reacting. I mean, we can point to numerous campaigns going back to 1990 uh, that have been directly aimed at slowing down the world's response on this. Let's talk about one specific example that that you helped uncover uh, a few months ago, and that's uh, Willie Soon. Can you explain who Willie Soon is and and who he was as a a scientist or who he is as a scientist? Yeah, Willie Soon is a... uh, a, very unique case study in how the climate denial machine operates. Uh, Soon is a an aeronautical engineer who declares himself an astrophysicist. He works for something called the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, which has very little to do with Harvard University except that it sits on its campus. It is uh, funded through the Smithsonian Institution, which is a quasi-public scientific institution running museums and, and scientific research in the country, funded by taxpayers. So, so Willie Soon is has been for mo- much of his career since the 1990s uh, confronting climate science directly, and his thesis is that uh, solar variation has more to do with the trends we're seeing in temperature or in uh, variation in the Earth's climate than greenhouse gases or forcing by greenhouse gases. So he has repeated this thesis. He has published papers about it. He has uh, proselytized on this around the world and in the media and in scientific literature uh, for almost two decades. One of his allies at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics was Sally Balyunas, who was also involved in multiple think tanks who were promoting this counter-narrative on climate change, uh, the George Marshall Institute, for example. And, you know, of course, here you have two PhD scientists at an institution with a great name, Harvard Smithsonian, and it was a very useful tool for the oil industry to have. And we've slowly revealed that they were being paid during from 2000 on almost entirely, if not entirely, through fossil fuel funding. And we just found all this out in the last few years, and we've slowly revealed it. The investigation this year had a breakthrough where we got a hold of not only the funding dollar amounts, but the contracts with the funders. So we have the communication between Willie Soon and his funders and between the Smithsonian and these corporate funders, showing them what he was doing with their money. And what he was bragging about was all these peer-reviewed studies that he had published about everything from the Indian monsoon to sunspots to uh, you name it, not all of them on specifically on the subject of climate change, but all of them with elements of doubt about the scientific consensus. And in those papers, most importantly, he did not declare that funding, his source of funding for the research. So he's telling the corporations, here's what I did for you, but he's not telling the world I was paid by a company to do this. And that that problem uh, ended up on the front page of the New York Times and other outlets. And these these papers that he did, even even though they were often in areas that he had very dubious credentials in, they were held up uh, by you know very prominent people like James Inhofe, a uh, U.S. senator who denies climate change is a problem, and uh, other places like they they got a lot of uh, attention. Well, absolutely, they have weight. I mean, this is back to the you know the the thing that matters is science drives policy. So if you have science that, you know, says there's no problem, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a myth, you're going to hold it up. And Inhofe and other policymakers on the Hill regularly would use Willie Soon as an example of uh, a countervailing force to the IPCC or to the scientific consensus. Soon himself came to testify. He also reports to his funders that he helped prepare testimony for another scientist to come testify on the Hill. And he's regularly held up as uh, part of this other team of scientists who doesn't agree with the overwhelming consensus. And that is one of the tools used by James Inhofe and other climate denial uh, elected officials to slow down the policy arena. 
And can you give me a, just an idea of like what what it's like to to read these emails? I mean, is it is it as um, blunt as as it sounds like it is? Like say like from Exxon or or from so and so to him saying you know pl- yes you delivered on these these papers. So- yeah, I mean, they're all online. Um, you can find our investigation on climateinvestigations.org, and we, uh, we have all the emails uh, linked there. But it's, it's a, a, a series of uh, interchanges that's fairly deliberate. One, one Exxon email back to him says, you know, just to be clear on your proposal, this, you mean peer-reviewed literature, right? And he uses another word. So they're, they're cl- it's pretty clear that they know what they're getting for their money. And you know, and then the uh, the other documents that are really damning are these contracts written between the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and the corporations to get the money. And they talk about the deliverables that are going to be uh, uh, done on the grant. And I don't know if you've ever uh, applied for a grant, but you you have to tell them what you're going to do, and then you have to report what you did, or you don't get any more money. So not exactly the scientific method. No, it's a little different. And and uh, Willie Soon was a, is a great example of how this this whole mechanism works. And I think it's probably the tip of the iceberg on what's really going on. But we got a we got a window in uh, through these documents that we recovered. So things are really heating up with the climate debate. I mean, we're leading into Paris, and it's getting more coverage in the media. More people are talking about it. And of course, the the incentives for the oil companies are also really making themselves apparent. It, it's clear that there's a lot of a lot of interest involved, and it's coming to a head, or it seems to be coming to a head. I mean, w- looking forward, what should we look out for in terms of the people trying to sow doubt? Are they going to have to go about it in different ways now that we understand some of the methods that they've used before? Uh, don't underestimate the other team. They are vicious and very active and very aggressive. So they're not done at all. They, in fact, are ramping up towards Paris. We've got some foreshadowing from several groups that they are sending teams to Paris. uh, One group is already bragging about how it's trolling around Brussels and in various state capitals trying to undermine national commitments and so doubt you know, within the, the policy arena in various European countries. Uh, this is not just a U.S. problem, it's global. And we, you know, we know that they know that Paris, if it's successful, will be a major step forward. And so the coal industry is very aggressively trying to intervene. Various other interests that the oil industry and, and utilities are intervening at the national level. We also know that, you know, the, the Pope, you didn't mention, but, you know, the, the, the Pope's message on climate change is drawing massive attacks from multiple think tanks, the same think tanks that the Kochs fund and that other corporations fund are confronting the Pope's message, moral message about climate change with a lot of venom because that's an even stronger message than just a pure environmentalist message. It talks about, you know, the moral obligation to solve this problem. And, you know, so they're taking that on, uh, there's some deniers who are putting out films in the fall, trying to counter it with with uh, multimedia. Uh, we're standing, you know, watching brief right now, just watching their every move, and you know, we think we have a pretty good idea of what they have in mind. But they are again very motivated and uh, also fighting a bit of the last fight here. They know, and they and some of them have stated that if things go well this year. Uh, we've, you know, they they managed to screw things up in Copenhagen with Climate Gate, with the you know the leaked emails, and uh, that that agreement got derailed and weakened by various forces. But now, you know, this is another moment towards Paris, and and then we're into a presidential election here in the U.S. We may or may not get a better climate champion than Obama, uh, you know, and that slows us down or enables the U.S. to continue to lead. Other countries like Australia have terrible leadership right now, Canada. Um, so there's a lot of obstacles to getting towards sanity on climate policy. The corporations are in it for the long haul, and they know that every year they can delay action is another year of profits. So it, it's, it's a broad fight, but you know, my, my mission is to try to reveal these things and show, show the world who's who the obstacles are. So uh, it's kind of job security for me, unfortunately. Well, Kurt Davies, uh, I appreciate the, the work you're doing. You, cer- you certainly will have a, a busy few months and, and a year or two going towards the election. Thanks for joining me today. Um, you're very welcome. Anytime, Kevin. 
That was my conversation with Kurt Davies, Executive Director at the Climate Investigation Center. And that's all for this episode of The Elephant. This episode was made possible with funding by the CKAA, a European society of entrepreneurs, scientists, students, professionals, and policy officers working to create a climate resilient society. Find out more at ckaa.eu. The Elephant Podcast is put together by myself, Kevin Kainers, and executive producer, Matthias Goetz. You can find The Elephant online at elephantpodcast.org and give us a shout on Twitter. Our handle is at Elephant Podcast. If you like the show, you could help us out by recommending it to a friend. Or if you use iTunes, if you could take a second and write us a review, it would be a big help. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you in two weeks' time.